Explore a path of serenity and inner balance as you dive into the universe of yoga with us. Join us in the online yoga course with Sadhguru. Sign up to experience the transformative benefits of yoga. The link is in the description. If any one of them are missing, you will say I'm a, not a complete human being in some way. So, the nature of life and our existence is such, what we think is… because our thought process and our intelligence has given us this wrong feeling that we are the center of the universe. No, the existence is not human-centric. We are just one tiny little creature. Significant though, significant we are. Because of our ability to be conscious, because of our intelligence, we have become significant, but only in our experience. Only in our experience. In the cosmic nature of things, tomorrow morning this planet may just fly away somewhere and vanish. Huh? Possible or no? Many of the asteroids passing by the earth are bigger than the planet earth. That's what we are these days everybody is fearing because all these years we did not know what the hell is happening. Now that they have seen some huge asteroids, there's a paranoia. If one of them come and hit us, what will happen? Oh, we will go into pieces, of course. So, who we are is not significant in creation, but significant for us simply because our experience is rooted in us. Because uh, I hear that you are uh, uh, among the foremost… Uh, there are many people here who are uh, foremost spinal surgeons. We refer to the human spine as Merudanda, that means the axis of the universe. I know many people just carrying this little body, already the spine is hurting. Axis of the universe <laughs> Terrible <laughs> Definitely they need a titanium <laughs> replacement <laughs> Why we are calling this the axis of the universe is, human experience is transmitted largely through the spine. Because it's transmitted through the spine and our experience is the basis of the universe for us. How do we know there is a world around us? Only because we see, hear, smell, taste and touch, all that is being transmitted through our spine. So universe exists not because it is, it is there, it exists for us only the way we perceive it. Maybe an earthworm doesn't know there is a moon. Hello? Most probably he doesn't know. He definitely knows there is a sun, I know. But he, he may not know there is a moon because it may not have any relevance for him. A bird may not know there is a cosmos and he doesn't care probably. But we know all this simply because of our enhanced perception. And this perception is being transmitted. In the process of evolution, one of the most significant steps is, I'm sorry, I'm talking to doctors, but should I? One of the most significant steps in the process of evolution is the making of the spine or the vertebrae as it is. Why such a thing happened is, when our neurological system started evolving, somewhere the intelligence of life realized it needs protection. When we say our visual apparatus, this is a very complex eye. It is able to distinguish minutest differences in many things which most other creatures on the planet cannot do. The first… even now this uh, sea life exists, there are certain fish in whom there are photosensitive cells. They can just sense there is light, they cannot see anything. That's the first eye. It's being taken as the first evolutionary eye, must be this fish because it can see light and darkness, that's all. From there, 
this sensory organs, these neurological developments have been phenomenal. And our… the richness of our experience is mainly because of the sensitivity of our neurological system. Be, this needed protection, it needed a conduit, so the spine came up. Another significant aspect of ecological process is, from a horizontal spine, it became a vertical spine. So in yoga, there's a whole system of yoga just training you how you can keep your spine erect to be aligned always. You're standing, sitting, running, doing whatever you want, but you are conscious where your spine is all the time because this determines how sensitive you are to life because your whole experience of life is being transmitted. And our experience of the universe is just the way we experience it, we don't know any other way. Because of that, this is the center of the universe, in the sense, it's like this. See, now this hall, we can see the walls. Now we can say which is the center of this hall, either that one or this one, we can debate a little bit. But when there are… when you cannot see the boundaries of this hall, this is universe, you cannot see the boundaries, I can fix the center wherever I want. Wherever there is intensity of experience, that's my center. So, human spine is seen as the center of the universe and also the axis of the universe, depending upon how sensitive you make it. Accordingly, the enlargement of your experience, the enhancement of your experience of life, happens, your perception is enhanced beyond your sense perception. Even to go beyond senses, still the neurological basis is very, very significant. This is the reason why we are saying only a human being can realize, the other creatures are not equipped to realize because their neurological system is not sophisticated enough for that. <coughs> Sadhguru, in the video we saw the Dhyanalinga, and it is always said that you have consecrated a lot of energy into Dhyanalinga. But you'd like to know what is this energy? Because uh, if you take uh, the 3,000 people here, we know that there are some people with high energy and some people with low energy. So is it that they are born like that or they are manufactured like that? It or... depends what was their breakfast <laughs> Pongal and no coffee. <laughs> After pongal you need degree, degree coffee. Degree coffee. <laughs> so how… what do you mean by this energy which you can take it and keep it in a different place and how do we get energized? People also say, I heard you say that you sleep only for two and a half hours. <laughs> so can you tell us the secret so… Uh, that was at one time. <sighs> The first twenty-five years uh, of my activity, on an average I slept two and a half to three hours a day. These days, uh, becoming a bit lazy, anywhere between three and a half to four and a half hours I'm sleeping. Uh, more by… not because of my age for sure, because uh, nothing has changed that way within me. <laughs> Just that uh, one thing is, these days nutrition is bad because uh, I'm traveling so much and I'm particular that the food is in a certain level of freshness. Once you leave India, most of the food that appears on your plate is minimum three months old. <laughs> it's very difficult to get something which is fresh. So that makes me go skip meals, skip meals, skip meals all the time. I think due to lack of uh, daily nourishment, I get nourishment. Once in two days, three days I get good nourishment. But there is no daily nourishment simply because of excessive travel. I think because of that there is a bit of slackness. I think if I eat well for two, three months, I'll be back to three hours <laughs> easily <laughs> So. Why does one person need… Uh, well, by prescription these days, uh, eight hours, is it? Seven, seven to eight hours. Seven hours. Okay, seven hours. 
and why another person can do with half of that. See, one thing is, as we already went through, the very physical body that you carry is just the food that you've eaten, isn't it? You are looking at food only as uh, protein, vitamin, mineral like this. But we're talking about a food chain, that means they're all different kinds of lives. What we consume is another form of life. Every animal consumes another form of life. This is the way the food cycle is created. So in what condition that life is will determine in what condition your life is in many ways. So if food appears in front of me, if I just look at it, uh, people have prepared it with elaborate care, if I just look at it, I say no. And so I say, no Sadhguru, Sadhguru, this girl, this lady has brought it, she's a very good cook, she's very tasty. I just look at it and say no, simply because it's not alive enough for me. It may be tasty, but it's not alive enough for me. If it's not alive enough, I will not consume. If you're just conscious of this one thing, you will see your sleep quota will go down. Another thing is, most people are eating at least fifty percent, fifty percent means hundred percent more than what they need to eat. Yes, you… you will do one thing, as an experiment, just try this, whatever you're eating, cut it down by fifty percent. If you're eating, let's say, uh, two kilograms of food, cut it down to one kilogram and eat variety of foods, you will see you will neither drop weight, nor will you become weak, nor will you become less energetic. Only thing that will happen is your sleep quota will go down. Because you're putting so much food to generate the same… same amount of energy, you're eating more by compulsion of liking the taste or simply by compulsion of filling yourself up now the body has to proce process so much food to create so much energy. This extra processing is taking a toll on the system. The amount of impurities that are there in the food will also determine how… how much inertia you generate in the body. Let's understand it this way, in terms of physical terms, what sleep means is inertia. Right now you're dynamic, this is life, inertia sets in. When inertia goes beyond a certain point, that's death. But sleep is a certain kind of death, but it is offering you rest. So restfulness is very important. What is being restful means is, if you sit here, if you are at total ease, you will see the body is naturally restful. If you… have you noticed on a particular day, you are very happy, on that day you don't need much sleep or food, have you noticed this? That's all you have to do. <laughs> if you remain very joyful every moment of your life, the food will come down, sleep will come down naturally <laughs> So there are many aspects to this. Fundamentally, if you keep your life energies very exuberant, now you will see the sleep quota will naturally come no. down. To keep it exuberant, you should not be overled. Largely, in the ashram, everybody, young people also, eat only two meals a day, ten in the morning, seven in the evening. Our activity <laughs> exceeds most people's activity in the world and we are seven days, three hundred and sixty-five days, we don't know what's a vacation because we are enjoying what we're doing. We don't want a break <laughs> So, they never go on a vacation, there is no break, there's no Sunday, Monday nonsense, nothing, every day something is happening endlessly. But you will see, people are very energetic, healthy, sleep is very little. So energetically, a human being can be at different levels. Why this is important is, see, what we call as life is just a combination of two things, a certain amount of energy and a certain amount of time. When it comes to time, it is ticking away for all of us at the same pace. Clock doesn't run slowly for me, faster for you, there's no such thing. Whether you are busy, you are lazy, you are sleeping, you are doing useful things or useless things, it doesn't matter what you do or you do not do, time is ticking away. So there is no such thing as time management. You can manage your energy. If you raise your energy to a higher pitch of intensity, what somebody does in ten years, you may do it in one year. So if you live for hundred years, it looks like you lived for thousand years.
simply because your energy is pitched up. This every human being can do. The whole yogic system is… one dimension of yogic system is just towards this. If you sit here, even if you simply sit here with your eyes closed, you don't sit here in a static way. You sit here in a dynamic way. You never become static because static is called as death. If everything becomes static, that is death. If inertia really sets in, that is death. So sleep in yoga is seen as death. You die every day. How long do you want to die in a day? You really must use this word for yourself. Don't tell anybody, <laughs> I'm going to die <laughs> For yourself, how long do I want to die in a day? Eight hours a day if you die. <laughs> One third of your life you're dead in twenty-four hours. Eight hours you're dead means one third of your life dead. Yeah. Another four hours goes into eating, sleeping, eating, toilet, bath, this, that. Where is the time to live, I'm asking? So, if life is precious, the most important thing to do is keep your energies in an exuberant way so that life becomes more, life feels enhanced because you cannot enhance time. Maybe you can live a few years longer, but you can't slow down time for yourself, do what you want. Do whatever you want, time keeps rolling. As you sit here, since you came and sat here, you're about an hour and a half closer to your grave. It's a diagnosis. <laughs> that was not me, okay <laughs> So, this is very important because one dimension of what we call as life, which is time. See, in Tamil language, this is very good. When somebody dies, we don't say he is dead. We say, Kalamai Tamil. Simply means his time got over. Perfect description, isn't it? All that happened is time got over. So, time is getting over as you sit here. Yes or no? Hello? Those immortal beings, I'm asking you <laughs> Time is getting over. As you sit here, it's going away. So the only thing we can manage is, how intense is my life energy? For this, we have a whole lot of systems to slowly work on it, work on it, work on it in such a way that, uh, you know, there were times these days, one night is okay, second night I'm bit down. Otherwise, there was a time, three nights if I don't sleep, continuous three nights, consecutive nights, I don't sleep, full day I'm working, full night I'm working. If you see me on the fourth day, I will be just fine, you won't even make out anything. Uh, today I'm little… as I said, this excessive travel, I don't have enough sadhana to keep me up like that. But one night, Two nights also I could manage, but one night effortlessly I will go, even today. How about… There was a question about Dhyanalinga in this, which I missed out. What Dhyanalinga means is, because time is running out for me, like everybody else, I'm not saying I'm going tomorrow. Everybody should know, time is running out. Hello? Yes. As we sit here, it's running out for all of us. Because time is running out, people on the spiritual path will always wonder, after Sadhguru what? What do we do? So, this was the vision of another great yogi way back, that to establish a form which is like a living yogi, but he won't travel, he's always there. A yogi without legs, good or no? <laughs> that he can't go anywhere but a full-fledged being with all the seven chakras and everything, full-fledged. Only thing is he doesn't ask for food, good. He doesn't sleep, good. And he doesn't die, very good. And he doesn't go anywhere, very, very good. So that's the kind of yogi we created who's sitting there right now. He can't walk, he can't talk, he won't eat, he won't die. Good or no? Insurance for future. Sadhguru, you said about uh, <coughs> Kalamanar, his time is over. 
So is that time a finite time for all of us? Because medically, there is so much of billions of dollars <laughs> being spent on trying to extend our life. So if we think that there is a finite time for everybody, so is this a wrong process of thought process to work on for research or is it a futile research? See, if all these idiots live forever, what do you do? Uh, in the chant that I did in the beginning, <coughs> Jananam Sukadam, Maranam Karunam, death is a great compassion if it comes at the right time. If we really want to… if we really want to punish you, let's say we won't give you death sentence, we will give you a deathless sentence, you cannot die. You will suffer much more than death sentence, isn't it? <laughs> yes <laughs> So, uh, only a fool who is inebriated either with money or hormones thinks he wants to live forever, you understand? Uh, either money has blinded him as… or his intelligence has been fully hijacked by his hormones. Such a fool wants to live forever. Otherwise, it's very nice that you come, you live a full-fledged life and you go gracefully, it's wonderful. But we want to live a full life. What does a full life mean? Full life does not mean a thousand years. Full life means Everything that is there for a human being to explore, know and experience must happen in this life. It's very important, a full-fledged life. So for this, how long can they live? People are investing billions of dollars. They don't have to. If they invest a couple of hours a day, we can make them live a full life <laughs> in the sense, both in terms of experience and time, in terms of time. Because our birth has a relationship with the cycles of the sun and the cycles of the moon, I will not go into the detail of this, this will get too complex. But to put it very simply, only because our mother's bodies were in sync with the cycles of the moon, we are sitting here today, yes or no? Huh? If our mother's bodies were not in sync with the cycles of the moon, we wouldn't be born. So, there are nine celestial objects which have significant impact on our body. Out of this, three of them are most important, the planet Earth which provides material for our body, moon which sets up certain basic cycles within our system and the sun. Everything here is solar powered. If one moves within you, these cycles are happening. In a female body, it's very obviously happening. Even in a male body, it is happening, but not so visible because a man is supposed to fend for the humanity. A man is supposed to take care of the survival. Today, life has changed in the world simply because of technology, not because of liberalism, okay? World has changed because of technology, that our survival process is no more going and hunting in the forest, our survival process is going to the office. Because of that, a woman also can go to the office as a man goes and probably do better because she doesn't have to smoke, she doesn't have to look at the other woman <laughs> So she is far more focused on her work, maybe she is more productive in the workplace. But man was structured by the nature, if we lived in the jungle, then man would be very important for survival. She would be important for other things. So if you look at the cycles, the lunar cycle is the shortest cycle that we have. There are other kinds of cycles, I will not go into the mathematics of it, but the largest cycle we can go into the solar cycle is twelve and a quarter years uh, long. So, whole yogic process on one level is focused towards taking the body from a lunar cycle to a solar cycle. 
From a twenty-eight day cycle, we want to slowly push this into a larger cycle, where our cycles are twelve and a quarter years. If that happens, the system becomes a total ease. Physiologically, psychologically, you come to such a state of balance. We have specific practices to move a person towards the solar cycles. These are called Surya Kriya. You start doing this so that gradually you imbibe a certain dimension. These dimensions are always on. The influence of the sun, the influence of the moon, the influence on our planet is continuously on us. Which will we allow to maximize within ourselves? A woman within the childbearing age, her influence, the mo influence of the moon is very heavy on her. That is a responsibility that she has, that's why we are alive, that's why we are born, that's why we are here. Because a woman's body was made like that. But over that, her life cycle also changes and she can also move to others. Even during the childbearing age, she can leave the reproductive system in that cycle and move the rest of it away. It is very much possible for a human being to do that. So, as this happens, a thousand and eight cycles of the moon is considered a full life. This uh, becomes uh, eighty-two something, a little more than eighty-two years, gets us to that stage. So, we say, for the sake of safety, because there are certain other aspects to it, we say if you cross eighty-four years, you have lived a full life. There are many changes which happen in the system once people cross that thousand and eight. So what is the maximum life a human being can live? See, in normal human being, I don't know what the medical science says, please tell me, I'm not conscious about that. Normally we see that by our own experience, a human being breathes between twelve to fifteen times per minute. Is that the understanding? If you're breathing fifteen times per minute, you're breathing twenty-one thousand six hundred times per minute. Twenty-one thousand six hundred is not just an accidental number that you have arrived at. Twenty-one thousand six hundred is the number of nautical miles across the equator. And for every longitude that you have, between one longitude and the next longitude, the space is sixty nautical miles. This is considered as a minute. Anybody who is an aviator or a navigator knows this. We call the space as a minute because that's one minute. And our breath and the cycles of the planet are very closely connected. If we drop our breathing to twelve on an average, suppose by doing the right kind of practices, you bring your breath to twelve, we say you will live up to hundred and eight years of age. If you drop your breath to nine, we say you will live up to hundred and twenty-four years of age. If you drop your breath to six, we say you will live up to one hundred and sixty-four years. If somebody comes to a state where they come to a static breath, no breath for long periods of time, that means it's almost like you're hibernating and re being reborn. Such a person, we call him a nirmanakaya, that means he recreates his own body. He goes into hibernation states and recreates his body. For him, we don't fix a time span, it is his choice how long he lives. Till he has a certain purpose, he may live and he will die when he's well. He will not die because of ailments, he will not die because of something, he will die when he's well. So, this is not like an absolute thing, this is a general trajectory of life. Sadhguru, we are having a lot of young doctors here, so I would like to ask two or three questions on behalf of them. Mm -hmm. You said that in Isha Yoga there is no weekend. If you tell that to young doctors, they think there is no life. Because sadly, due to WhatsApp messages and Facebook and all the things that come, there's a big problem for the younger generation on work-life balance. So how did you manage to make a weekendless week? <laughs> 
I'm just asking it in a selfish way for my hospital. <laughs> 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 See, uh, well, there are different things to attend to in life probably. There is a family and there are friends and there is pleasure and there is picnic and so many things they want to do. But I was… Uh, first time many years ago, first time when I was in United States, uh, They took me to restaurants which was TGIF. I said, what's TGIF? They said, thank God it's Friday. I said, what? No, no, the thing is Friday afternoon means uh, already they stopped working and they're thinking of a party. So they're living for the weekend. One who suffers the week and lives for the weekend is a very… Misery life, isn't it? How come you don't enjoy the week? Only weekend? Simply because a whole lot of people, uh, I am not commenting on your doctors, I am saying generally a whole lot of people are doing things which don't mean a damn to them in… to themselves. It doesn't mean a damn thing to them. They're just doing it because it's a way of earning a living. Uh, yesterday some television channel was misinterpreting what I said long time ago, <laughs> very badly. I said, uh, when I was ten years of age, I told my father who was a very ardent physician, not a simple physician, very ardent. So all his life academically he's excelled in everything and a dedicated doctor, he became a doctor because he lost his mother when he was four and a half years of age to tuberculosis. So there are very touching stories how uh, uh, he used to go to see his mother and she would put a towel on his face and kiss him because she was afraid she will infect him. And uh, those days there was not much treatment so they just built a house for her on a hillock thinking that fresh air would cure her tuberculosis, but she passed away at the age of maybe twenty-one or so, twenty-one or twenty-two maybe, young woman. So at that time, she told him, this, it's a very rich uh, merchant family where naturally by the time you're twelve, you're into business. So uh, she told him, you must become a doctor because she felt if some other kind of doctor had come, she would have saved her life. We don't know what turmoil she went through, who knows. So he committed that he will become a doctor and at the age of twelve when his father tried to force him into business, he left the family, went outside, leaving a very wealthy family and studying outside on the streets and slowly he became a doctor. So the first thing he did was, he served in the Mysore sanatorium for tuberculosis. For three years, he worked in the sanatorium for fifty rupees a month. So he is that kind of a doctor, totally dedicated. Uh, later on he served in the government, whatever. So his… his idea of success is, you must become a doctor. If you are not a doctor, you are no good for anything, at least when it came to his children, that is the expectation. So I didn't want to disappoint him later. So when I was ten, I told him, this is one thing that I'm not going to be. You know the… did you know the future of doctors even then or… <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so all along my father was always worried that I am not getting trained for anything specific. Don't create the expectations, there will be no dejections. <laughs> it's like I throw a stone up, Sadhguru, I throw a stone up, why is it landing on my head? <laughs> well, that's how it works on this planet. If you don't want it to work like this, you must leave this atmosphere and throw the stone up, it just continues to travel straight up. This is how it works here. 
If you throw it up, it lands on your head. No? You… you are like a… somebody who plays solitaire, you know? Yes? This is like playing solitaire. This is just uh, because you are like a person who wants to drive on the Mumbai street without knowing anything about the vehicle that he drives. You don't know how to drive, but you got into your car or motorcycle and tried to do… Motorcycle won't cooperate at all, first moment you will fall, car is little easier. Anybody can make it roll, you know, kids on four wheels. So if you drive, then you say, Sadhguru, I am driving, but there is so much fear, what to do? And people are dying on the street, what to do? <laughs> well, that's what will happen. <laughs> So if you want to drive it, you spend some certain amount of time learning to drive before you hit the road, isn't it? This is also just like this. Before you start your life, you must spend some time learning something about this machine, isn't it? This body, this mind, how to use it, in what way it operates best, shouldn't we spend some time? No, you just jump into life. And this I create expectations and I get dejected, obviously unrealistic, <laughs> isn't it? So, oh if I don't create expectations, maybe I won't do nothing. That's not true. Anyway you're doing something, isn't it? Even the bees and the birds and the ants and the elephants are doing something, isn't it? Hmm? Whatever they can do, aren't they doing? So that's all you can do also. Whatever you can do, you can do. What you cannot do, you cannot do. So we taught you Isha Yoga to remove all the other nonsense. You understand? If you can look upon everything around you the same way, everything that you can do, you'll do. What you cannot do, you'll not do. What's the problem? That's how the whole existence is functioning, isn't it so? If you ask this planet to spin backwards, can it do it? So even Mother Earth cannot do, so what's the big deal? You are just a piece. Isn't it so? The Earth is spinning like this, if you say spin like this tomorrow morning, can it spin? No. So what's the big deal? You can only do what you can do. So once you see this, your whole life will be focused on how to enhance your ability to do, not waste your time and silly expectations. Life will happen the way it happens, not because you desire. It happens because you're enabled in a certain way. Instead of enabling yourself, you're wasting your time in silly expectations of yourself. So, instead of spending your time building fancy expectations, spend your time to enable this one. What you're capable, that's all you will do, isn't it? Can you do something more? Can anybody do something more than what they're capable of? No. It is just that your capability can be stretched. Without stretching your ability to do, you're building expectations. It is just fundamentally wrong. Isn't it? No? It's fundamentally wrong, isn't it so? Now I want to run hundred meters in seven seconds. <laughs> you shouldn't think of this. You should just work on your legs and your lungs and just run. Maybe, <laughs> who knows, you'll run it in six seconds, who knows? Why are you worried about the time? You build your legs into as powerful a condition as you can build it and just run. Just for the simple joy of it, we don't know what will be the time. Twenty-one minutes.
So, uh, don't waste your life in setting up expectations because these expectations are not even yours. You're looking at your neighbor and setting expectations for yourself. It's a very, very silly way of building your life because your expectations are not even yours, isn't it? I'm telling you, human mind is such, let's say in Mumbai everybody had only one leg. Hmm? You had actually two, but everybody has only one. They're all hopping around. You will also do that, though you have two. Because you're setting up your expectations, looking at people around you. So, there's no need for any expectations. Just enable yourself, whatever the situation allows, will do. Just, oh, this is all you have to do. Build your body and your mind in such a way that you can use it to the fullest capability. So whatever kind of situations arise in front of you, accordingly you act, not the fancy way you like. You know, right now, we have started a whole different form of education in Asia called Sanskriti. They have no formal education. They're just learning yoga, classical music, classical dance, Sanskrit language, English language and martial arts, nothing else. These kids know nothing, but you come and see them. <laughs> Absolutely like this, because we're just teaching them to use their body and their mind to the fullest capability. You will see by the time they're eighteen, they will be phenomenal creatures. Because your success in this world is just this, the physical world, the success is just this. How effectively can you use your physical body and your mind? That's all your success is, is that so? Hmm? That's all it is, isn't it? A little bit of knowledge you need, the damn knowledge is all on the net, you don't have to keep it in your head. It's all in the net. Unless you want to do some specific kind of activity for you, want to build some knowledge, you can do that. But that also, I would say the whole education system, which is little over twenty years right now, can be compressed to five to six years if people are of a certain mental capability. And every human being, almost every human being except those who are impaired in some way, almost every human being is capable of this. If only you take off the silly expectations which are a crippling factor because your expectation is if somebody is doing this, you want to do one step more. Even if that's a, a crippled standard, so you don't go about building expectations. You just work upon building your body and your mind to enable yourself that you can use it to the fullest extent. We don't know how you will use it. What you do in this world should be relevant to the situation in which you exist, isn't it? Action is always about the situation, not about you. If this one thing, if you get it, then there will be no expectation. Simply you do what's needed. In a given situation, you simply do what's needed, that's all. If you're placed in Mumbai, you learn the stock market. Hmm? If you're placed in Kanyakumari, you learn fishing. This also you do well, that's also you do well, that's all, wherever you are, that's all there is, isn't it? Be a multiplier of love and knowledge. Share this video with those you love and together let's spread light throughout the world.